if you have an area of your life right now where there is no peace, then you just need to bring that area of your life into focus of the Prince of Peace, and He will bring peace into that area of your life. Because the problem is that you don't have peace in, your li in, in that area of your life. It's that you don't have that area of life in the Prince of Peace. We're in a series called I Am Connected. And, um, and, and so in this series, I Am Connected, we started out with uh, the first sermon in the series was the most excellent way. And we understand from Scripture, 1 Corinthians 13, the most excellent way is the way of love, right? So Suzanne made me these cool t-shirts to wear as a reminder. Love is why we do what we do, and love is why we are connected. It is love that connects us together, and it's that most excellent way that we are connected. And last week, we talked about the connected way. How, what does that look like, and how does that happen, and how do we stay connected with God? How do we live for Him and, and not live according to the world so that we can live into our destiny and we can experience that connected way that He has for us to move and operate in this world. And so uh, this week, we're going to talk about the devoted way. The devoted way is a way of life. It's a the Christian, listen, I've mentioned this, I think, in every sermon. In the early church, in the first church, when the Christians were still becoming what they were becoming, we didn't quite, people around didn't even know what quite to make of them. This was a whole new movement, a whole new uh, way of doing things. And, and it was in that moment, it was in that way, that, that they looked at these peculiar people and, and began to say, these are people of... Uh, the way? Maybe, I don't know what they're doing, you know. They didn't even know what to call it because they were seeing them do things that they had not seen anyone else do. They hadn't seen anyone else be able to live in this way of not only miracle signs and wonders, but also in love and compassion and, and generosity and pouring themselves out for the sake of others and, and living the way that Jesus had called them. And they were living in the way. <laughs> And no one could quite explain because you can't explain love. You can, you, you know it when you see it, but you can't explain it, right? You can give examples of it and you can give illustrations about it, but you can't really explain it. You can't really define it. And, 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 and so when you try to define it, you're kind of stuck with, well, you know, that way. And, and it's in the way that they live. It's in the way that they were living, that they, are, that they were identified as those who were following Christ. And it was later on in a, in a Gentile place that they were called Christians. In Antioch, the, the word Christian, literally, I get in trouble every time that I say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. The word Christian literally means little Christs walking around. Little imitations of Christ. Little copies of Christ just Xeroxed off the machine and sent out into the world to be Christ to the world. Are you with me? If you're going to get mad about that, just get over it. Just go be Christ. Don't be mad. Be Christ. Come. Oh, that's good. Anyway, because <clears throat> Jesus wants us to be Him. Jesus just wants us to do what He did. That's why He came. Jesus came and lived among us. You know that Jesus could have done everything He did on the earth to save us in about, I don't know, 10 minutes? And yet, He chose to live here over 30 years. Why? So that He could provide an example for us of how to live. He didn't just live for us to, so that we could have a Savior. He lived for us so we could have an example of how we are now to live. Amen. What Jesus did is what we do. Jesus Himself said, the things you see Me do, you will do even greater things than these because I'm going to empower you with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give you the power of the Holy Spirit in your life and you're going to be able to go into places and you're going to heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out demons and perform miracles all around in My name because that's what I do and that's what I want you to do. 
And we as the church, we've forfeited that. We've laid that down. We've let that go because we've said, oh, well, we just look at what Jesus did and we stand in awe of him and we celebrate him, but we don't do what Jesus did, which is a big problem to Jesus (laughs) because he's like, well, that's why I came there for 30 years. That's why we documented my life by four different authors, so that you could read it from different perspectives. So you could understand me in different lights and different ways. It's why we gave you the book of Acts, so we could show you what it looked like when devoted people to Christ went out and lived their lives for Him, as Him, to Him, with Him, and did all that He did, because now He has empowered them to do what He did. Jesus came... So we could see how to live. He lived a devoted life. His life was devoted to the work of the Father. He said, I don't do anything that I don't hear from the Father. I don't say a word that I don't hear from the Father. I, I, don't, I don't think a thought that, doesn't re- that I don't receive from the Father. It's, it's in that understanding, that devotion to the way of life. Of living from the Father. And when Jesus said, everything that I do, everything that you see, if you've seen Me, you've seen the Father. Why? Because He was a, he was a perfect representation of all the fullness of the deity of God come to life incarnate in the flesh. And that's what we are to be. We are to be His body, to represent Him well, to re-present Him over and over and over and over and over everywhere we go, everything we do, everything we say, every thought we have. We are to re-present Him to the world. And it's in that devoted way that my life is devoted to something. I am devout to a cause. And if, and if we're not careful, we can end up, we can end up splitting our devotion. And, and, and in splitting our devotion, and, and we begin to say, well, Christ wants me to do it this way, but I don't know, you know, the culture says I ought to probably go this route, or, or this is the more politically correct way, or, or this is the way that's not going to get me in trouble with my boss, or, or, or this is the way that's going to, you know, keep my friends that, that, uh, that I like to hang out with sometimes, you know. God doesn't share devotion. <laughs> you can't split devotion and truly be devoted. We, we, are, we are single-minded focused. And that single-minded focus is focused on Christ. Keep your eyes locked on the author and perfecter of your faith. Everything else that we see in the world, we see through peripheral vision. Because everything that we see in the world, we're looking at Christ first and then we're filtering it through that focus as we look at Him, the things that are not of Him just begin to fade away. They begin to slip out into the darkness. They slip out into obscurity and they, just, they don't matter anymore. So what are you devoted to this morning? That's, that's maybe a, a hard question. What, are, what is your devotion given over to? Is it to Christ first? Is it to God first? Because when you are devoted to God first, listen, people will talk about, oh, well, well, we need to set up some priorities. Our priorities need to be God first, and then, and then family, and then, and then church, and then my ministry. You know, there are a lot of different ways you could, you could do this, but, but here's what I've come to believe and, and what, I, what I've been taught by those who have lived well is that there is no priority except one. (laughs) It's God first. And when God is first, everything else will find its place. But I can't say God first and then number two because at some point, number two might need a little more than number one and I might have to rearrange. That's not an option. It's just not an option. But when I put God first, everything else becomes easier. (laughs) Everything else becomes under His power, under His sovereignty, under His grace. 
under His peace. If you're, if you're living, if you have an area of your life right now where there is no peace, then you just need to bring that area of your life into focus of the Prince of Peace, and He will bring peace into that area of your life. Because the problem is that you don't have peace in, your li- in, in that area of your life. It's that you don't have that area of life in the Prince of Peace. <laughs> that was... That was good. I was going to write that down. <clears throat> I tweeted that in my mind. Anyway, so, so the Apostle Paul, speaking about this devoted life, he, he, he comes to... He, he, okay, Bible study time. Just a, just a minute, okay? We're going to do a little Bible study. The, the book of Romans is, a, is the doctrinal thesis of the, the, the Apostle Paul. Right? The Apostle Paul captured pretty much everything that he says anywhere else in the Bible in the book of Romans, doctrinally or theologically. There are other things that he writes in the Bible that, that are specific, that are directed, that are training, that are you know, different things. But doctrinally and theologically, he captures almost everything he says in the book of Romans. And then we can see the book of Ephesians is kind of a small version of the book of Romans, kind of a condensed version. The, 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 the letter to the Colossians is kind of a condensed version of the book of Ephesians because it's, it's the same thing. It's the doctrine is the doctrine. And so, but it's in the book of Romans where he expounds on it. He really digs it out and, and, and tweezes it out for us. And, and it's in chapter 1 through 11 where he basically makes the case for the, the great grace and mercy of God. That we were sinners without Him. We have no recourse. We have no option without Him. We could not do anything. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are, we are stuck in our sin and trespasses. We are, we're just in trouble, right? We are the objects of God's wrath without Him. Uh, also in the book of Romans, there is, he, he says that through God's creation and, re, and revelation to the world, through the world, through what has been created, that we stand without excuse excuse for believing that there must be something higher that there must be something bigger you can't look at creation you can't look at the world you can't look at the universe and think this was an accident that's just unintelligent (laughs) and so he says but because But because of sin, because of your rejection, because of what we've done against God, because of our our, our resisting of Him, we've fallen short. We've been disconnected. We've lost our connection. But while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still stuck in our trespasses and sin, Jesus did what needed to be done to restore the connection, to bring us back from the objects of wrath of God to the objects of the grace of God. And and it's all in the book of Romans chapters 1 through 11 that he just lives that out. He brings that out. In Romans 6, he talks about the grace of God. What, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means we have died to sin, but don't you know that all of you who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death so that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, reaches into your baptism and raises you from the dead with Him to live the new life. To be what Christ called you to be. To fill you with the Holy Spirit and empower you to go into the world and to be Christ for Him. And it's it's in all of that that we are that we are taught, that we are informed, that we are, that we are made aware of the mercy of God and His grace in our lives. And how much we need Him desperately. And, and so he comes to Romans chapter, uh, chapter 12. And Romans chapter 12 is a 
pivotal moment in the book of Romans. It's the moment where it goes from doctrine to practical. It goes from this is the theology and the doctrine of what, what makes it all possible to now here's what you do with it, right? And, and so in Romans chapter 12, if you want to turn in your Bibles or in your app, we, I'm just going to, here's the point that I want to get to today. If I haven't gotten there yet, we'll get there in a minute. The devoted life is empowered by God's grace and experienced through connection with others. I want you to understand that. It's empowered by God's grace. All of God's grace makes it possible for us to receive what God has given us. By His grace, He has freely given us. It costs Him everything, but He gives it to us for free because all we have to do is receive the grace. That's all you can do with grace. You can't earn grace. You can't deserve grace. You can't buy grace. If you do any of those things, it ceases to be grace. And it need it has to be grace. It has to be the grace of God that saves us because we owe a price in anything other than paying that price in full requires that we pay it with grace through someone else. And so it's in the grace of God that we are empowered. Listen, grace doesn't just give you a get out of jail free card, right? Or get out of hell free card. Grace doesn't just give you a, a, a clean slate. It doesn't just wipe away your sins. It does all of those things, but it doesn't just do all of those things. What grace does is it elevates you from slave to free. It elevates you from orphan to son or daughter. And it's in that son or daughter of the Most High King that you now begin to move and operate in the authority that you were meant to move and operate in in this world under the power of the Holy Spirit that now you speak to demons and they run away the way they did when Jesus spoke to them why is it recorded that jesus spoke to demons out loud i'll tell you why so we could hear it so we could know how to speak to them get out and it's and it's in that way that we stand against the spirits that come against this world (laughs) We have so much authority and so much power because of grace that we don't exercise because we think that it's just physical. We think that it's just this world. When in fact, it is mostly spiritual. And if, and if we are willing to speak against, to stand against the principalities and powers of this dark world, then we can bring light. You see, when you're you're a principality and a power of a dark world, but the king of the light world comes in, your world just got lit up. Your dark world is no good anymore. Come on. You, when, when you are the principality, the, the ruler, the prince of darkness, but light shows up, how many of you know darkness loses its power? Darkness loses its authority. Darkness cannot stand against the light. When Jesus came in the first book of John, it says, and the light of the world came, but the, but the darkness could not comprehend it. <laughs> it couldn't overtake it. It didn't know what to do with it. But we know what to do with it because we are children of the light. And it's in view of God's mercy. It's in, it's in understanding this grace that empowers us, His mercy that empowers us, that releases us, that moves us from orphan to son and daughter, from, from object of wrath to position of authority in the kingdom that we are now released into our destiny to to live out and to do what it is that God has created us to do. But we experience that through connection with others. This is where I think we as the, the church in general, the Big C Church, has maybe lost a little bit of our way. And we're, and we're, bringing, we're bringing us back to the way. Come on. We're, we're coming back to the way. To, to the most excellent way. To the connected way. To the devoted way. Because it's that way where we come together and get to live out 
what God has put in. You can't live out the grace that God has put in you alone. You need other people for it to be the object of your grace. The object of your power. The object of your authority. And and it's there that we get to that we get to experience. So Romans chapter 12. I wasn't sure what part of this chapter I was going to use, so I just put the whole thing on there. So you can look it up. It's in your Bible. It's on your phone. It's in the app. It's all over the place. So it's probably in the back of your chair if you... Romans chapter 12, listen to these words. Therefore... Therefore, all this stuff in 1 through 11, chapters 1 through 11 is true. Therefore, here's what's about to happen. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, because we now know about God's mercy and grace, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. To just give Him everything. To give it all over to Him. Because here's the thing, you can't hold on to it anyway. I I think I quoted it last week or somewhere this past week. Maybe at the gathering on Wednesday night. If you're not coming to the gathering on Wednesday night and you're connected here at Connection Christian Church, you need to get up and get out and come on. That's all I want to say about it. When you... When you understand that God's mercy releases all of this to us, and now it's through His mercy and grace that we get to release back to Him our bodies, our lives, our time, our efforts, our thoughts, our talents. Everything that He's given us, we give it back to Him. Here's the thing. When <laughs> the kingdom is a frustrating place to give. Because whatever God gives to you, You just give it back to Him. And whatever you give back to Him, He just gives it back to you. And whatever you give, you just give it back to Him and He just gives it back to you. And you give it back to Him. You get it. And it just becomes a culture of giving, a culture of pouring out, a culture of releasing what we have. You see, God doesn't give us anything in this temporary life to hold on and to make permanent. We are not... The the things that God gives to us are never to terminate on us. They are to come to us and through us into the world so that God can bring them right back to us and we can have more because he who is faithful with a little will be given more, pressed down, shaken together, overflowing over and over and over and over and over. And the world would like you to think, oh, if I give, I just got poor. No, not if you give in a spirit of faith. Not if you give in a spirit of worship. Not if you give in a spirit of obedience. Every time that you do that, God just takes that whatever it was, presses it all together, pushes it down, and then turns it right back on you and puts it right back in you. But you have to believe it by faith. You have to operate in faith, not fear. Because it's faith that releases all of this to us. It's faith that releases everything. It's faith that releases healing. Almost every healing in the New Testament that that Jesus was associated with, Jesus said, your faith has made you well. Why? Because they were willing to let go of something. The, The woman was willing to fight through the crowd as sick as she was to just touch the hem of his garment. That's all she was doing. She just fought through. She went after it. She pressed in just to get to the hem of his garment because she thought in her mind, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. She had faith that released the power of God and God didn't even know about it. Well, you know what I'm saying, right? So it was, it's in that way of pressing in, moving and operating in that faith that we, get to, that we get to experience the holy and pleasingness of God. He says, says, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Holy given over. Holy means consecrated. It means sacrificed. It means laid down. Here it is, Lord. It's all yours. Take it. And it's in that moment that you lay anything down, that you consecrate anything to God, that it becomes holy. A sheep in the Old Testament was just a sheep. 
until it was brought in the temple and it was sacrificed and laid on the altar and all of a sudden it became a holy sacrifice. It could have just been another sheep. But because it was given over, it became holy. And it's there that we become holy. It's there that we become, that we step into the destiny that God has for us. The devoted life. He says, he says do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be renewing, but by the renewing of your mind, of your thoughts, you have control of your thoughts. You get to control them. And by re- controlling them and making them according to what God wants, testing and making them approved of Christ, you renew your mind and the Holy Spirit renews your mind. You give your mind over to God and He will make it new. Whatever you give to God, He makes it new. We take old things, old wineskins, and He makes us into new wineskins that can hold new wine. So He says, do not conform to the patterns of this world. That means the culture and the ideals and the, and the customs, the traditions, the thoughts, the, the, the values of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Here, here's the thing. People ask me all the time, one of the most common questions that a preacher gets is, what is God's will for my life? Here's my answer. Have you given God your mind? Have you given, have you, have you given, have you laid your mind on the altar? Have you put it down so that God can transform it? So that He can, He can put new thoughts into it. He can release new information into it. And, and, and it's only laying on the altar that it becomes holy. But uh, listen, here's what I want to... In verse 3, he says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith, the faith God has distributed to each of you. You see, God has given you the faith that you believe with. That, that's <laughs> Verse 4, For just as each of us has one body with many members, with many parts. And these parts, these members, do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. You see, I don't just belong to me, I belong to you. You don't just belong to you, you belong to me because we have been called together to be a body. And if, and if you don't function, then I suffer. If I don't function, then you suffer. Because we affect one another. Because we are of the same body. And it's in that body that we, that we experience the flow of the grace of God. You see, you can't experience the grace and the empowerment alone. It's in a body that you feel it. It's in a body that you experience it. So if you have the gift of prophesying, of prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If God's given you the faith to prophesy, then prophesy. If you want to know more about what that is, you need to come on Wednesday nights because that's where I have time to dig into these things a little deeper. He says, if, if it is serving, then serve. <laughs> Even when it's hard. Listen. Sometimes it's hard to serve, right? Sometimes you got to fight through some frustration. Sometimes you got to fight through some some aggravation. You got to fight through some systems that are in place. You got to fight through, but you can't give up because God has called you to serve. And it's when you serve that the body receives the grace and experiences the grace. But the devil will try to stop you. Because the last thing he wants you to do is to live into your part of the body. Come on. If you're a hand and you're meant to serve as a hand, but the devil's got in your head and saying, well, the only good place to serve is as a foot. And you get all wound up in trying to be a foot when in fact you're a hand. You are not going to serve well. But when you give into the good, pleasing, perfect will of God and say, here am I, Lord, your sacrifice. It's not about me. It's about you. Whatever you want from me, here is my 
self, a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to the Lord, given to you for whatever you choose for me to be. If you want me to be a liver, I'll be a liver. If you want me to be a little toe, I'll be a little toe. If you want me to be an eyeball, I'll be an eyeball. It doesn't matter what you want me to be because I know that whatever you created me to be is what I will ultimately not only be more most satisfied with, but I will be most effective at. So we seek and we pursue and we chase hard after the will of God in our lives, desiring what He wills and what He wants. But, but, it, but it has to be done in a context of a body because we can't do it alone. This is why we are building God's family together and the connection matters. Come on. A finger that's disconnected from a hand is just gross, right? It's of no value. It does nothing good for anybody. But when you put that finger on a hand and it begins to work with the thumbs and, and, and the pinky and the wrist and the elbow and the shoulder, all of a sudden that hand can become very powerful and very useful. And that finger can do things that the rest of that arm and shoulder and body cannot do without it. And you are a finger, you are a hand, you are an eyeball, you are a mouthpiece, you are a nose, you are something in the body of Christ that when you live into that, you will find your destiny. You will find why God put you here. And this can be frustrating. (laughs) I know. I know from personal experience and I know from walking through it with many other people that the devil wants you to not find this thing and he will try whatever he can to hide it from you. But in view of God's mercy, the devil has no power to keep you from it. Come on. Yeah, because without the grace, the devil has all the power. But with the grace, God has all the power because the debt is paid, the price is over. It's no longer there. It don't hang over your head. So we get connected connect to the body and we become what God has called us to be. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement like it's your last breath. If you have the gift of encouragement, and and listen, here's one gift that I will point out almost every time. If If you've ever walked out the door and I said, Thank you for the gift of encouragement. It's because I saw it on your life while I was here. I saw it on you. And I will always point this one out because here's what I believe. Those who have the gift of encouragement, those who have that gift of, man, that was good. You give, me a, give you a hug and just lift you up and just being there, just their eyes, their, their smile just lights you up and makes you want to take over. Listen, what does that do? That pours courage in. When courage comes in, fear has to go out. And if the, oh, come on. Oh, I just need like one more hour. That's all. That's all I need. Just keep playing, Kevin. Just keep playing. If it is courage, then if it is encouragement, give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. (laughs) Have you ever known a person that just has the gift of making money. Like everything they touch just turns to gold. Everything they, every endeavor they try, it just works. It's just, every business they start, it just takes off. It just goes. It, it, listen, they have the gift of making because God has also given them the gift of giving because you can't give what you don't have but if God has given you success in something he's given you that success of making so that you can operate in your real gift your true gift which is giving to the body giving to the kingdom giving into the the ways of the world listen there's a reason There's a reason that America has the strongest military across the planet. We're not the biggest one, but we are the strongest one. Because we give into it. 
because we're not forced to serve in the military. We get to serve in the military. If you were a veteran, you didn't, unless you're, you know, maybe in the draft from Vietnam, but, but since then, it's been a voluntary military. Because they're not there because they have to be. They're there because they know they get to be. And they get to fight for a country that stands for something. And listen, I don't care what CNN or Fox News or anybody else, any other talking head out there says, America stands for something. We stand for God. We are one nation under God. We were built on godly principles and we will stand on godly principles. And it's up to you, it's up to me, it's up to the church to take our stand for God. No, 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 let me just quantify, qualify that. I'm not taking a stand for the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, the Independent Party, the, you know, Landscape Party, the, I don't know what other kind of parties are out there. I don't even care about parties. What I care about is are we living into the destiny as a church and are we living into the destiny as a nation that God has put on us because God has blessed us mightily and we better be faithful with that. Come on. So if it is to lead, do it diligently. And if it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. What has God called you to do? What has God raised you up to be? What is it that, that just drives you crazy? What is it that frustrates you the most? That's probably your gift. That's probably what you're supposed to be doing because it bugs the but Jimmy's out of you because nobody's doing it. That's the reason. Because you're supposed to be. Come on. <laughs> Let's all stand. Why don't you just grab a hand of somebody next to you? Feel connected. Just want you to feel connected right now. Just grab somebody's hand. Just imagine that that hand, your hand, and that other person's hand is like a—it's like a tendon. It's like a ligament. It's like a, a sinew that connects joints together. That brings bones together and holds them and binds them in place and makes them strong. And it's in that connectedness that we find our strength. It's in that connectedness that we find our power, that we find our true leverage. So Father, we just thank you and praise you for the connection that you made possible through Christ so that we could be in you and you in us. And Holy Spirit, we just say, come. Come and bind this connection that we are gathered in right now. Find our place. Help us to find our place and our calling and our, our purpose in you, our destiny, so that we can live into all that you have created us to be. We can represent you well. We can represent you to the world everywhere we go. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's sing together.